everyone. Welcome back to the SDG Pavilion here at COP29 in Baku, Azerbaijan. My name is Ariel Alexevich. I'm a Sustainable Development Officer in the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And we are thrilled to be here with many of our partners from the Sustainable Water and Energy Solutions Network. We are going to hear from them some presentations about the work they're doing, and we will have a short discussion afterwards. So first of all, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Katie Harris, a senior policy fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, to come up and deliver a short presentation. Welcome. Yes. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here today uh, in such esteemed company. My name is Katie Harris, uh, as was just introduced, I'm a senior policy fellow from the Stockholm Environment Institute. And I'm here today to talk about uh, the water energy nexus in climate adaptation strategies and some of the threads of research and engagement that we feel need to come together in order to advance this agenda. Great. So, SCI, the Stockholm Environment Institute, has a number of projects that collectively aim to address the water energy nexus, uh, including in climate adaptation strategies, spread out across our different global centers. And it's my pleasure to just present a handful of these uh, on behalf of my colleagues here today. So the first point I want to make is about integrated tools for data modeling. To address the water energy nexus in climate adaptation strategies, we need tools to help us understand complex data on the supply and demand of both water and energy. Forecast and simulate how these, these might change in a warmer world, accounting for multiple, often competing demands and uses and we need to explore alternative development and management options. So SEI's water evaluation and planning software, also called WEEP, is a practical tool for water resources planning that allows us to do integrated modeling analysis on the water, energy, and actually also the food nexus. We have applied this tool, uh, and I encourage you all to check it out. Uh, in a number of cases. So first of all, at the regional level, such as the Sir Daria region in Central Asia, to understand the interplay between food, water, energy, and ecosystems and their impacts on the macro economy. At the national level, such as a study of the water, energy, and food nexus in Jordan, which aims to address the interlinked challenges uh, of water scarcity, agricultural productivity, water quality, and energy independence. And also at the city level, through a study to explore whether water scarce megacities, such as Beijing, are consuming energy in order to conserve local water resources. My second point is about building capacity to navigate trade-offs and harness synergies and co-benefits. So that's a lot of uh, jargon there, but what do I mean? So to address the water energy nexus in climate adaptation strategies, we need to identify and support capacity building projects with communities, with local officials that draw on strong stakeholder engagement to cultivate strong stakeholder ownership. This is really essential if we're going to navigate trade-offs in energy and water use, but also to harness synergies through opportunities that the development of green and clean technology affords. So in La Guajira, for example, in Colombia, we are working with indigenous communities who lack basic access to water to harness the benefits from a solar PV water pumping and desalination plant that was built as part of a deal to construct a wind farm on indigenous lands. The third point I want to make is about local ownership of integrated development plans. 
So we need local officials and communities at the heart of designing adaptation strategies that enhance resilience to climate change impacts through better access to adequate water and energy and improved food security. So in Kenya, for example, we are working with local officials on navigating the water, energy and food nexus for ecosystem based adaptation in the Ewazonera North catchment through a project that aims to integrate the governance and management of water, energy, food and environmental resources. In Ghana, we are working to support the development of integrated development plans, such as those in the Bui Reservoir, which aim to generate 400 megawatts of hydropower, 400 megawatts of solar power, and 40 hectares of new irrigation in the future. My fourth point, and there are only five of these, I promise, is about debunking myths and understanding the political economy. So we need adaptation strategies that account for the socio-cultural implications of an attitude towards the energy water nexus. Small scale hydropower is rapidly growing and a diverse set of actors are making claims about its benefits that include the generation of cheap, low carbon electricity or providing fast and flexible, uh, fast and effective flexibility to energy systems. But research increasingly shows that small scale hydropower can also have significant socio-cultural and environmental impacts, such as local biodiversity loss or water supply issues. SEI researchers are analyzing the role of small scale hydropower in energy narratives to provide a better understanding of the politics of energy transitions and trying to estimate both positive and negative impacts at the basin level with a focus on the EU and its close neighborhood. We also have a number of other projects that are exploring the role of water access in reducing multidimensional poverty, for instance, in Bolivia and Cambodia. My final point is about adopting a transboundary lens. So we need adaptation strategies that reduce transboundary climate risks associated with the energy water nexus. So these might be transmitted through a country's shared water basins and or their imports of energy, for example, including those generated via hydropower. So let me just give you an example. India has power exchange agreements with Nepal, for example, to utilize the country's surplus hydroelectricity. This includes a 2024 agreement to import an additional 10,000 megawatts over the next 10 years. But the future production of hydroelectricity in Nepal can be threatened by a number of climate shocks from glacial lake outburst floods to extreme rainfall. Moreover, the availability of water in the region is expected to peak mid-century in tandem with accelerated glacial melt and subsequently decline. So if these sorts of impacts occur, they will affect not only hydropower uh, in countries such as Nepal, but also cascade through their trade agreements, potentially jeopardizing energy investments and energy security in importing countries such as India. And we at SEI are aiming to understand these kinds of risks, including through the partnership we co-founded called Adaptation Without Borders. So, to hear more about these projects and SEI's work to address the energy water nexus in climate adaptation strategies, we encourage you to check out our podcast. It's called Water Stories. It's about the world of water. SEI experts break down complex topics such as efforts to manage water in California, the importance of giving ecosystems a voice in water and energy planning, the intersection of poverty and water and energy availability, and the role of computer models in managing water and energy in a changing climate. So just thanks very much. I look forward to hearing your reflections and also learning from all your experiences and perspectives on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, for that presentation, and it's great to see your global work. Um, right now, I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Gonzalo Saenz de Miera, Director of the Climate Change and Alliances at Iberdrola in España. Over to you. Thank you very much for inviting 
us to this. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. First of all, let me start by sending my regards to Valencia. I don't know if I'm sure you know that only two weeks ago uh, experienced severe storms and severe floods with catastrophic impact in terms of life and in terms of economic impact. And this catastrophe uh, is an example that was aggravated, of course, by climate change and is an example of why we have to accelerate climate action, not only mitigation, reducing emissions, this is our job, especially in an energy sector, but also increase action in adaptation. So, I work for an energy company that is called Iberdrola, and our main focus is to reduce emissions, because climate change, the main cause of climate change is an energy model based on fossil fuels. So we have to move from fossil fuels to renewables. This is what we are doing. But at the same time, we are seeing the consequences of the water crisis. Because we need water to produce all our energy. And as you were mentioning, there, are, there is an important nexus between these two elements that are in, cri are in crisis. Because we have an energy crisis, but also we have a, a, a water crisis. So let me share with you some reflections on both issues. On, on water adaptation, on water what we are seeing is a growing demand and what we are seeing is a decrease in supply. Decreasing supply because of warmer, global warming, the increasing temperature, but also more frequent severe extreme, uh, uh, climate extremes like uh, storms, droughts, floods and so on. So in this context, I think there are three main policy directions. First, try to save water. In everywhere, for instance, in Spain, I don't know, 80% of the, of the water use is by agriculture. And there is a huge room for improvement because the water techniques that we are using are not efficient at all. Okay. The second thing is, and there is a growing debate now in Spain is, um, water infrastructures but we have to I, to analyze very well what we need in terms of water infrastructures because water impact infrastructures has also an impact on biodiversity that is another crisis we are facing but definitely water infrastructures and there are differences between developed and less developed countries of course okay and the last thing I wanted to mention is desalinization and this is becoming increasingly important. Why? I mean, to, to increase supply. Why? Because energy, there is an energy revolution, an energy technological revolution in the power sector. And only 10 years ago, desalinization was very expensive and very polluting because this water needs to be uh, transformed using natural gas. However, today we have renewable resources and renewable resources that are becoming extremely cheap. The problem with renewable resources is that they are intermittent. However, in desalinization, is, this is not a problem because you can desalinize water when you have a lot of power, for instance, solar power. And in many countries like Spain, there is an excess of supply of, of photovoltaic now. So I think the nexus between water and energy in terms of desalinization is extremely interesting. For instance, for countries that we don't have water in Spain, but we have a lot of renewable uh, power. And this is the case for many other countries. In terms of energy, what we have to do because of climate crisis is completely change our energy system, move from fossil fuels to renewables. And in terms of adaptation, that is the theme today of this debate, I would like to, to say three things. First, moving from fossil fuels to renewables is less water dependent. Why? Because renewable, energy and, uh, uh, renewable uh, technologies do not use water. I mean, we will 
I, I will say something about hydropower later. But solar photovoltaic and wind, that are the main technologies, the main renewables, do not consume water. To move from fossil fuels and, and to renewables, you increase the uh, security of the system because you are more, less vulnerable to like water crisis, storms and so on. Because if you have one, just one coal station in a country and there is a problem with the coal station, you lose all the power. However, if you have distributed generation, it's much better. This is in terms of generation. Uh, in terms of generation, there is also hydropower. And here in hydropower, I think is hydropower is, is very important for the energy system, but for the uh, power system, not in self of generation. In terms of flexible technology, why? Because power sector, uh, hydropower, and you, you know very well, is a flexible technology that you can store its energy, like basically in, in, in water. So it's very flexible, but at the same time, so it's very good for a system based on renewables. But at the same time, it's very good for water management because you can, it can play a role in, I don't know how to say in English, but to, um, to manage these floods or heavy storms that you, ha you have in, in many countries, like for instance in Spain. So I think the role of hydropower infrastructures in terms of water and energy is also very interesting. And the last thing I want to mention is networks, electricity networks. And electricity networks are really important to integrate renewables, to decarbonize the whole economy, I mean to electrificate the economy, like transport industries, to move from fossil fuels to renewables through the electricity. So we will have to develop a lot of networks, but those networks need to be adapted to climate change because those networks are not yet adapted, as we have seen, for instance, in Valencia. So in this context, too, I think there are important issues to analyze in this water nexus, um, uh, water energy nexus in terms of adaptation. One is to move from uh, fossil fuels to renewables. Uh, the other is um, networks, and I think this is a very important link. Um, hydropower as i was mentioning and i think this is a question for the future desalinization with renewables so to conclude i think that th we are suffering this crisis at the same time the relationship between those crises are very clear but i think what it's needed is more coordination in terms of policies and uh, as you were mentioning projects and they are very interesting in but I think, from my perspective, we have to move from projects to whole system. Because if you want to provide electricity to Africa, for instance, if you act through projects, you can't even cope with a growing demand for, you know, for, for, for people. So I think we have to work together in order to define systems like micro networks, isolated networks, extension of networks that cope with this in an efficient way. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo, for those remarks and also for reminding us that people are suffering in Valencia and we will, uh, part of what we want to do here is to keep them uh, in the conversation. Um, right now, I would like to uh, hand over the floor to Mr. Gustavo Paredes, International Advisor at UNALA, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, I feel like Leah Princess with these things, so I think it's, it's better to talk. Uh, thank you very much to to the network and this opportunity. It's really important to try to to talk about very important issues, and it's very important for Latin America and for Central America, because all the time we are talking just about, when we are talking about Latin America, they start to think about from Panama from to, to town, you know, to Brazil, Argentina. And well, we are part of this is UNALA, this is Latin American uh, sugar producers members. We are in, now in 14 countries because Uruguay is part of this network from uh, last week. 
and we are working together with different organizations and we are working for example from Guatemala with the all the members of the sugarcane offices uh, and in Brazil is for example 345 producers just in Sao Paulo and is one of the most important uh, uh, organizations around the world and this is just a little numbers about what are we doing is 6 point uh, 6 point5 millions of jobs we uh, made in the in the area uh, three hundred and seventeen um, independent producers we have in the in the in the in the chain of production uh, production 52 million of tons of sugar it's like 30 percent 34 percent of the sugar around the world 31 millions of tons of the sugar exported that uh, almost that from the to the us and and europe 11 millions of hectares of harvest and 31 million of the ethanol producers that is like 32 percent of the ethanol production in uh, around the world and this is very important because we are pr not just producing we uh, we give the electricity for the matrix of some countries like guatemala we have the pro the matrix in guatemala the 42 percent of the matrix of the electricity in guatemala in the dry season i think that's very important when we are talking about when i hear uh, gonzalo because it's very it's, it's very important to talk about the localization of the problem and the situation because in Latin America it's really important to talk when you are in the dry season how we can work with the cogeneration and it's not that all the cogeneration is in the same way but in 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 our country in Guatemala this is a really good example of how we can reduce the use of water and we can are more efficient with the with the uh, electrification and with give more opportunities and the other thing is very important is how these organizations provide the data to the governments because this is another very important situation for latin america is how we can provide the data uh, our governments need our help from the private sector and working together because you know in Latin America is not like Europe and we, we need to work in the in different way when we are talking about data. Uh, we have a really good partners with Olade that is helping a lot with that and we are trying to give more information to the people. But, well, now I want to, pro uh, to introduce what some of the projects we are uh, having in different of the, our countries. We are very happy because we are the first organization like Unala. And we start with Asaswa, is the president of the of the Unala in this moment. We are the first one to uh, to implement the uh, SDG case studies of the 17 SDGs in our different organizations. The last year we make the presentation of the case studies in Guatemala of the, all the Guatemala cases. But now in May of the next year, we are going to present the implementation of the SDGs in 14 countries. That's very good because we can show how the agriculture can work direct with the SDGs and how we can work with the different situations. And where we are talking about uh, sustainable development issues. I think it's very important for people, for countries like us, if we are not just talking about environmental issues. We need to talk about social and economic issues. For example, we have the disaster risk management in Guatemala. You know, Guatemala is placed among is one of the most environmental vulnerable countries in the planet. That's really important for us because Central America have a lot of situations and not all the people knows our situation is in, in, in the region, you know. And the Guatemala Sugar Agro Industry provides a support of the uh, comprehensive programs uh, to disasters in different ways, not just in environmental area, just to in the social situations like in the COVID uh, situation in, in Guatemala. But in that way, we want to, to show what are we doing and the activities we are doing in this way. We are working in the risk management and floating and early warning, including float emergency, because that's really important in our areas in Latin America, because the government not all the time arrives to all the, all, all the situations near our um, areas of the production. And we cannot just think about our miles you know we need to talk about the people are working with us and the families that's very important because if you have the people happy and you can provide for, for uh, to them not just about the um, 
the good uh, education we need to provide to them a, 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 a good life uh, situation that's really important. That's why we are working together with them, with the manage of the of the support of the communities and municipalities in the manage of the water and health, including potable water systems, designing with the construction with them. But because what happened in Latin America, for example, if you ask for the people, if you give the money, they ask you, we want they don't, they are not thinking about water problems, for example. And we need to help them to think in the water problems and they think to in the energy problems, you know. And in that way, we working together to try to find the best solution and technical solutions to give the ideas to work in, in, this, in this situation. We are working in the reuse and recycling water, including advancing the efficiency of the reuse of the factory in the advancing the wastewater management. Uh, watershed management, including the forest in the high areas, biological corridors and reforestation. That's very important too, because we are trying to make the education to the people to take care about the biodiversity. We have a lot of problems too, because we need to educate the people. It's, it's not just to talk about climate change, because no, not all the people understand what is climate change. We, I think it's, it's, we talked yesterday in another conference and we say like, if you start to say to the people NDCs or you start to talk about different uh, uh, words, they say, I need to eat. I need to do this. I need water. I need electricity. You know, that's why is we are. It's very important to work with them and try to make more education and try to make feel they are part of this. That's for us is very important. That's why we advance in the river management, included technical uh, roundtables with the multiple stakeholders, ensure that an ecological flow is the main rivers in um, in in the area. That's why because we have to is to show to them. It's not just us, we have to take care of that kind of uh, situation. We have to work together and that's why we are working in, in that area. That's why we have more than 16 plans to work with the different local communities. We are working in the different areas of the Guatemala, on the coast of the, of the Pacific of Guatemala. The other work we are working uh, doing in the area is the integrated water uh, watershed management. That's important because not all the people understand when uh, Gonzalo talked before about agriculture systems in the water management. It's very important because the people don't understand maybe, for example, when you are talking about agriculture, the sugarcane agri-industry, we are not using, we are using the 70%, 73% of the water we are using came from the rain. We are not using the, the rivers or in this way. And we have to show to the people how to take care about the the different uh, uh, watershed uh, areas, because this is really important for our our cities, because sometimes the people don't understand how we can work together and how we can start to make a progress to, uh, to reduce the impact of the, uh, of the uh, in the areas. Uh, in that way, we are looking forward to working in the, in the cooperation with the local governments and with the private sector. And we in Guatemala, we introduced the ICC, the first private climate change institute. And that's very important for the area because we can share with them all the information and we can share with them all the best practice they can do with this project. Uh, we are working in the generation of primary data of the waste uh, sheets and establish of the baseline promotion and flow of the social organization process of managed waste uh, water sheets, effective management and protection of the forest and integrate of the water resource managers. And the other thing is really important is to talk about the soil protection activities, you know, because if we are working together with, with the people and the communities, this is really important for us. And the other one is we are going to pro, uh, show what are we doing in the same in El Salvador. Uh, we are uh, working with the strategy uh, communities resilience. And this is the other way with in Latin America, especially in Central America, we are working together with the, with the communities, trying to help them to understand what are we doing and how the sugarcane growing communities can be uh, part of the projects and keep part of the systems. In that area, we are working with them in the different uh, um, 
activities like environmental education, like we are doing in Guatemala too, and more than and, uh, reforestation of the areas. That's very important for all of us to try to show how we can do with the forest and how we can work in with the adaptation problems in the different countries in, in Central America. The, we are replying these different activities, not just in Central America, and we are put all of these projects with our members of the UNALA in the 14 countries. And we have another uh, reports and we are be helping with other countries like Brazil because they are having a, an incredible projects like uh, Ethanol Mas Verde is one of the most important projects uh, in the reforestation education situation in Latin America. And we are working together like a network to try to, re to resolve the problems about water and energy situation with the communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo, for telling us about those projects in uh, Guatemala and El Salvador. Uh, right now, I'd like to invite Ms. Karina Dolabella, Coordinator of Climate Change and Sustainability of SEMIL in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, today, I will talk a little uh, bit about our adaptation plan that uh, is actually now uh, on public consultation. So, okay, oh, okay, okay. Well, uh, we. Are you listening to me? Okay. Uh, we call our uh, adaptation plan uh, PARC, okay? So just for you to understand. PARC is a part of Sao Paulo's climate change strategy. Um, it includes actions, projects, and policies to make Sao Paulo more resilient. Uh, and we follow carbon economy. So, Sao Paulo uh, strate climate strategy focus on both parts of climate agenda, mitigation, reducing emissions, and adaptation, preparing for climate impacts. Uh, each part has uh, its, own, uh, its own plan. So, uh, for mitigation, we have the climate action plan, uh, it, uh in uh, 2022 and for adaptation we are finishing the uh, adaptation plan uh, so it will be on public consultation until December 20. Well these plans uh, were created with help uh, for uh, German Agency for International Cooperation and uh, coordinated by uh, our Environment, Infrastructure, and Logistic uh, Secretary. Oh. Okay. So, uh, PEARC uh, is a structure uh, around two, uh, five axes, uh, five thematic axes. So, uh, c a coastal zone, water security, food and nutrition security, healthy, biodiversity, and we have uh, climate justice and infrastructure uh, are included in each topic. So it's a um, big challenge to uh, include uh, these two topics in these fi fi uh, five axes, but we are uh, in a hard work if, uh, with thematic, gr thematic groups to guarantee these um, these issues. Uh, well, uh, our adaptation plan adopted some uh, premise for this first implementation implementation cycle. Uh, the first implementation cycle 
focus on starting actions, uh, setting uh, short term goals uh, as three years uh, as part of a 10 year plan. Uh, it collaborates with municipalities to strengthen their climate agendas uh, with the state direct responsibility promotes climate justice and resilience uh, infrastructure. The goal is to uh, continue to improve the plan based on the, less, uh, the uh, learned lessons and enhance climate, climate uh, resilience across São Paulo. Well, uh, the impact uh, methodology uh, was used to identify key impacts of the most critical climate uh, treats for each thematic areas. This process helped uh, us to identify problems, prioritize them, and outline specific actions and sub-actions for each topic. Uh, the plan was development with uh, input for, from over 80 participants, including a state uh, expert and a lot of research. This, uh, this uh, image uh, illustrates the logical chain applied using the coastal zone as an example. Uh, well, the draft version of adaptation plan uh, lists uh, 49 main actions and uh, 216 um, uh, sub-actions, organized into seven groups, okay? Uh, these actions focus on building a strong foundation for climate resilience across São Paulo, addressing both both uh, immediate needs and long-term goals. Uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, our adaptation plan was made available for public consultation at uh, the start of November, and it's, it's still um, on public consultation until uh, December 20, uh, using an online form uh, for the, our website. So uh, uh, you can share their opinion, your opinion on the proposed action and sub-actions, suggest, suggest uh, change, add new ideas and remove existing ones. Uh, you can also vote on which action should be prioritized. Uh, to help uh, create an implement implementation uh, of our adaptation uh, plan, a communication and social participation plan was developed. Uh, the goal is to keep people involved and informed about our adaptation plan. The plan has two main focus. Communication, uh, keep an open channel to share updates about our adaptation plan and help people understand why climate adaptation and resilience are important. Uh, and the second uh, is the social mobilization that seeks uh, to improve intersectoral and uh, coordination as well as the mobilization of the participants, uh, the groups and communities uh, in vulnerable uh, territories and with greater exposure uh, to impacts of climate change. Well, uh, by the end of the consultation, five more listening sessions like this will be carried out. Uh, I would like to thank you for the this presentation and well i am here for everything if you have any question 
uh, it will be a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Karina, for sharing everything about the work you do in Brazil. Uh, it sounds really good, and um, people can learn more, of course, by going to the Sustainable Water and Energy Solutions Network website. Um, and as our last um, uh, presenter right now, I'd like to welcome Mr. Gaston Sirot, uh, who is part of the um, Latin American Energy Organization, or OLADE. Hello, I think we have a presentation, but I will, I will start. Um, I didn't know that uh, in order to get uh, the invitation for the guys, we need to have a name with a G. We had Gustavo, we had uh, Gonzalo, and now you had Gaston. So I'm very glad of uh, the name I had, otherwise it would be very, very difficult to be here to, with you uh, today. So let me introduce you briefly, uh, OLADE. OLADE is an intergovernmental organization uh, with 27 countries. It has 21 years old. And uh, the main focus is... I, it's okay? You hear me? Yeah, okay. So the main focus of the organization is to cooperate, is to coordinate uh, different efforts and national politics in terms of energy. So um, it's extremely important because what we need today is to seek integration in terms of energy, better planning, and especially when we are looking for two very particular resources like water and energy. So it's very, very important not to start working with silos, but to start working together. So that's one of the main message and that's how OLADE has the, 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 the actual importance in terms of an organism that seek integration, collaboration and cooperation among the countries from Mexico to Chile. So that's how important this organization is for the region. So in terms of generation, in terms of natural resources, our region is the greener region in the world. We produce 60% of our energy, of our electricity, from renewable sources. 9% of the whole energy matrix, so not only electricity, but the whole energy matrix, come from hydropower. So this will give you the importance of the water in the region. So we had 9% of the whole energy on the region, 40% of the electricity comes from hydropower. So that's a, these are the main figures, 9% of the whole energy, 60% um, of our electrical matrix from hydropower and 40% of this uh, renewable energy comes from hydropower. We have 20, no, 200 gigawatt of hydropower. However, due to the climate change, what we are facing, it's a very complicated situation. Depending on water, it's a, good, it's a good thing, but it can also bring some, some issues. Like uh, um, our colleague mentioned from Iberdrola, the, um, the situation they're living in Valencia. This year, 2024, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we had five countries with shortcut or blackout in their countries. So that's just to have an idea, 21st century, 2024, and we have five countries that in different moments they had blackouts or sh power shortcake. So it, we have to keep in mind how important this climate change is impacting on us and what's the solution? We are talking about this decarbonization of what, as part of the solution. I believe there's a word that could help us a lot, diversification. We need to start making our energy matrix more diverse. So do not put all your energy in one single solution. Just try to find the most resilient. And this is something that will have a very, very strong impact in the Caribbean as well. We need to have this electric energy matrix as diverse as possible. So when we talk about hydropower, what we know is what we said, 
the potential is 600 gigawatts. So we are exploiting not even 30% of our capacity. And this 676 is not just a, a number, it's a real project. We are talking about a potential of real project. If we go, for example, to solar energy, we are exploiting only 1% of Latin American Caribbean uh, potential, 10% of uh, wind energy potential, and 29% of hydropower pot uh, energy power capacity. So we still have a lot to exploit in order to keep on making our region greener and greener and greener. So what we have here in terms of the perspective, if we want to achieve with the objective of 2050 uh, of, uh, of net zero, we will need the hydropower capacity to be triple. So you can imagine in terms of the time that will require to put those projects on, uh, on, on, on going, the money, the budget that will be required, and the political organization. And why am I talking about the political organization? If we go to the biggest energy power plant in the world, and I'm not talking only for renewables, I'm talking in the world, is Itaipu. Itaipu is a binational uh, power generation. It's between Brazil and Paraguay. So we have a lot of work in terms of coordinating uh, national politics in order to get one project into a reality. This power plant generates over 3 million uh, gigawatt hour. So it's a huge amount of energy that was produced during the last uh, 40 years that show us how important this coordination among the countries is because some of the rivers in South America or Latin America, what they do, they not divide country, they make them work together. That's another key message. The frontier, the barriers that we have among the countries are the ones that will help them to start working together. They have this responsibility of using this resource on a very responsible manner. And this is how I think we can achieve those, um, those goals of renewable energy, of doubling uh, energy efficient, of tripling um, renewable capacity. Of course, we don't, we don't have to forget about the impact of this, uh, of this technology. It's not something that we don't have to look at it. We know that this technology can have some, some, some impact. Uh, you will have to build them, so you have to flood uh, areas. However, all these impacts, the real work you have to do is to check how you will mitigate them. And normally it's something that will help you to build strong very very strong bonds with the communities in all renewable projects and i'm not talking about only hydropower projects solar wind geothermal um, biomass project you need to have very strong relationship with communities they are the one that will be the pushers of the project or the stopper of the, of, the, of the same project. So keep in mind that even if we have some impact on the uh, micro scale project or on the big uh, side project, you will have to work from the day one. And day one is not when you start building, it's when you start having the idea of the projects. Just be sure that you bring all the communities, all the stakeholders to the same table in order to make those projects from a dream to a reality. So. We know we have a lot of impact, but we know that we have the skills in the regions. We know that we have the will in the regions. And we know that in spaces like this one, you can have the financing to make this uh, a reality. So to conclude, to conclude, we will just give you some examples of uh, some solutions that Olade uh, provide. For example, this was in, in, in Guatemala. Actually, we'll be a bit fa faster, where we had small uh, scale project of uh, hydropower in order to help communities to develop their own projects. So this was a 90 kilowatt uh, plant that has a completely different uh, objective. We are not talking about generating power capacity for the country. We are talking about bringing a solution 
for a munis for a community. So the same resource, different focus. You can have it the biggest power generation in the world, or you can have a local solution for communities. This is hydropower in the two different scales. So just to close our, our presentation, we have a mature technology. We know that we have this climate uh, situation, but hydropower can help us by avoiding floods, for example, like we had it in, uh, in, in Spain last year. If you can control the resources, even if you will have some problems with generator, you can have as well a solution. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you, Gaston, for telling us about your work. We appreciate it. And I would also like to note for everyone here that we do have another member of the Sustainable Water and Energy Solutions Network here. We have Sebastian Gros, founder and CEO of SoulShare. Sebastian, I wonder if you would like to come up and say a few words about your project? Yeah. Uh, uh Club of G's, <laughs> as you said, uh, I learned a lot about uh, your work in Latin America, so it was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm from SolShare. We, together with uh, Grameen Bank's uh, Energy Arm, um, are also a network member. And just to put another perspective into uh, projects with communities, um, we deal a lot with uh, solar water pumping for agriculture. And here the biggest challenge really is, if you have the seasonal effect, you really only need the solar capacity for half the year. So that makes the economics of the project very challenging. And since we don't want to go for a project as um, Gonza Gonzalo, right? Yeah, Gonzalo said, we need to be able to scale it up, right? So we came up with a scheme where you have an energy sharing grid so that excess energy can flow into the solar water pump, but you basically have a diversified usage pattern where people can share electricity and it's automatically accounted on their meter. So whenever they sell electricity, it goes up. Whenever they buy it, it goes down. Um, so it's a smart meter project, and that tries to maximize utilization of all the energy capacities. And that's uh, uh, what brings us to that network. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sebastian. So we have just about five minutes left, but I think there's at least one question we can get to for our panelists. Um, and you can just use the mics that are on the table there. Um, but, you know, when it comes to international cooperation for sustainable water and energy solutions, what kind of support do you think is most needed, um, is most critical, if, if it's financing, technology transfer, capacity development, data, something like this, and, and why, and if there's any measure that you think is, is the most critical to be implementing now, um, please, please tell us. So is there someone eager to go first on this? Katie, perhaps. Yeah. Sure, uh, great question. Um, it's hard to narrow it down to one particular type of international cooperation, but in general, um, I coordinate a network called Adaptation Without Borders, and we're trying to really strengthen international cooperation on adaptation. At the moment, most countries still plan uh, adaptation through their national adaptation plans. Uh, they can often be quite siloed, depend, developed independently from each other, and they only account for the impacts of climate change that that country will uh, is projected to experience from within their borders. What we've been talking about today a lot is the need for this integrated systemic approach. We need uh, to build resilience uh, of our water and energy systems uh, from a, from a systems perspective. Uh, and for that to happen, we really need much stronger cooperation between countries in developing their national adaptation plans to understand how they are vulnerable to climate impacts through their import of energy supplies, through their import of water supplies, uh, and, and really to then strengthen cooperation uh, to on adaptation at that systemic systems level, uh, regionally, internationally. So I would just say we're, we're really advocating, this is why it's really important to have these discussions in spaces like this, so we can really engender a more more international cooperation on, on adaptation, particularly to these transboundary risks. Thank you, thank you, Katie. I think uh, Gonzalo. 
Yeah, I fully agree with you. I think we need more cooperation, more alliances. And I think it's important to get private sector involved in this process. Why? Because we are doing a lot of things and we are suffering climate change. And so it's, it's not a question of policies that is really important and planning, but this it implies a huge changes in, in society, a huge changes in infrastructures. And for this reason, I think that we have to work together. Government, firms and civil society, universities, or think tanks and so on. And we have to do it urgently. Okay, Gustavo, over on this side. Thank you. Um, I think something very important is to talk to the people. I think that's very important with the cooperation because I have a, 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 a situation before it's, we, we always say from, I live in Spain too, but I, oh, the people say like, you need this. Maybe it's not the way. Maybe we need to talk more with the people and hear more what they need. Uh, because it's like we say before, is we have to localization of the problem of the situation and how we can use the natural resources and how we can help the people because sometimes they are, we are thinking, for, uh, for example, uh, we have a situation with the clean cooking and they are talking about we have to put the solar uh, uh, implementation here, but maybe not because we have storms for during four months during the year and it's like you don't have the solar situation and we need more cooperation to uh, after this kind of events have a, a more conversation with our stakeholders and working together to try to know more about us and how we can work together us like members of this network for example and how we can work in together with the united nations too thank you thank you and gaston i couldn't agree more with what you said so in, in the case of latin america and the caribbean we try to put on, on, on movement what they just said. For example, we understand we need cooperation. That's why we had this organization. We need to have the private sector involved. During one week a year, this year was in Paraguay, we had the Energy Week. The Energy Week is a week where we have the 27 ministers grouped together and working on the what the region need. And we had session with the public, so it open like here in COP and you have a whole afternoon where you have the CEOs of the most important energy companies and energy consumers uh, company, so the energy intensive companies working together in a regional um, private and public meeting. And uh, what we have decided to create this year, it's a regional planning uh, uh, meeting and group that will help us to understand how to move forward. So this, I think, it summarizes the excellent ideas that we, we, we haven't invented. We just listen to the one that know and we just implement it. So this is what we are doing at least in, in Latin America with, uh, with Olade. Great. And I think, Karina, for the last word here. Uh, just I uh, would like to say that uh, I think plans are really important and relevant, but uh, the most challenge is to uh, implementation and uh, concrete actions. So we need to scale up. And this is a really challenge. And we know that the decarbonization uh, is really expensive. And we have a lot of uh, other questions that you need to uh, address. So um, this is the big challenge. Plans are really uh, is the structure of everything, but we need uh, to scale up the concrete actions uh, to uh, change uh, the the mindset and everything that we are looking at the moment. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for participating in our panel. We really appreciate it. And we encourage everybody in the audience to continue this networking for water and energy solutions in our networking space. Uh, and thank you for tuning in at home. And that will be it for now. Thank you so much for joining.